Please welcome author of A World Gone Social, Mark Babbitt. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're here to talk about social leadership and specifically how the world has gone social. And we've already heard a lot about today about the change that's, that's already all around us. And there's no bigger change in the world right now in, than in how we lead. And I, but I don't want you to confuse social leadership with social media. And in that regard, it's kind of ridiculous I'm up here even talking about this, because I, five years ago, I had no concept what social media meant, other than my teenagers doing Facebook instead of their homework. So my teenagers are, are always on Facebook instead of doing their homework. Well, right about then, we launched a community called U-Turn. U-Turn is an online site where college students can come to gain powerful information that'll help them go from their college world to the working world. So we talk a lot about internships, mentorship, job interview techniques, personal branding, social media. We talk about all that stuff. Well, our original goal was to work through universities, through the career centers. Well, right about then the recession hit. Universities didn't have any money, specifically the career centers. They were, they were getting laid off. There's no money to spend. So six weeks before we launched, September 10th, 2010, then we had to pivot. We had to completely change our business model. So we all met at my house. We're a virtual company. We all met in my house in Lake Tahoe, and we said, what are we going to do? Everybody go. We had a couple of beers, maybe a couple other things, and really thought this out. Came back the next morning, and a millennial in our group said, Mark, I got it. We're going to go blogging and social media. We're going to be the first ever talent community online. And I said, okay, what's the talent community? And to this day, it's not in our business plan, it's not in our model, it's not anywhere, you can't find it anywhere. But he explained it to me, you know, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, blogging, content, and I just looked at it and said, bullshit, that is not gonna work. How can that work? You, we're not gonna spend any money on advertising, we're not gonna work through universities, not gonna work. So, fast forward about three months, we've been fighting now for three months, me the whole time going, bullshit, 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 this is not gonna work. Finally, they dared me to get on a Twitter chat. Anybody ever do a Twitter chat? 60 minutes, all using one hashtag. I see a couple heads doing this. All you do is talk about one topic. Well, this was a career-related topic. And 60 minutes later, I was hooked. I met 200 people I would have never met before in my life. Career center professionals, young professionals, college students, resume writers, um, uh, personal branding experts, 200 people in one hour from all over the world. And I went back into the office the next morning and I said, I'm hooked, we're doing it, get everybody a Twitter account right now. No more bullshit, right now, do it right now. And ever since then, we've been going crazy. So here we are five years later with it still a monthly run because we do everything through social media and blogging, not including because we're a volunteer organization, completely purpose-driven, passion-driven. Our monthly outlay is about $1,000 a month. And we're in the Wall Street Journal, Inc., Entrepreneur Magazine, everywhere. Right, so this can happen. It happened to us. And that was the basis of the work we're doing. Now we have two other sites. We have switchandshift.com, which is a leadership consortium and a consultancy. And we also have, we're launching Forward Heroes. What U-Turn is for college students, Forward Heroes will be for our military veterans to help them make the transition. And we're doing this in a scalable, repeatable way. All right, so what does all that mean to you guys? Five years ago, I knew nothing about social media. Who's on Twitter now? Well, we got a few more hands in Germany. That makes me feel better. Germany scared the poop out of me. <laughs> like one guy went, I think I have one. Um, how about LinkedIn? Who's on LinkedIn? And Facebook? Okay. You guys get it, right? It's already happening. Right now, here's the difference. We're not yet running our companies from those portals. M many of us are not. But it's not about Twitter and Facebook and all that. It's about building community. It's about scaling. It's about amplifying. It's about taking what you know and what you stand for and letting the world know it. Okay, that's what social leadership is. All right, it's, it's a mindset. It's how, we, it's how we communicate. It's how we innovate. It's how we collaborate. It's how we compete. And we saw the graphs earlier today. We gotta change. We gotta change the way we attract employees. We have to change the way we retain employees. We have to change the way we keep our customers. So if we're not on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and we're not actively listening, we're not changing. Social, for the first time ever, allows us, whether you're a B2B or a B2C company, to actually listen to your customers in real time. 
We've never had that opportunity before. And, but you have to be a social leader to take advantage of that. So my first indoctrination into social leadership was before social media was even popular. Twitter existed then, 2007, 2008, but it hadn't become popular yet. It was in the second startup that I was brought in to help fix, and our CEO was just terrible. He, was, he just had no, he was an engineer, introvert, he had no concept what it took to actually motivate people. So it was a disaster from day one. They did raise $13 million from VC companies, but then they blew through 11 million of it in about 12 months. Right, so I was brought in to help fix these guys. And we tried and we tried and we tried. Finally, they brought in a new CEO, kicked out the, found, the three founding dysfunctional guys. Me and the new CEO take over. And Bud is his name. Bud goes down to the, to the um, sales floor. By the way, just show you how little the CEO knew about culture, climate, motivating people. He put 110 salespeople on a floor with no windows. Downtown San Jose office building, zero windows. Right, so Bud goes down to the fourth floor and he just starts talking to people. He walks into their cubicle and says, so, what's going on today? What's, your, what's, your, what's the challenge you're facing today? How are the kids? How's the wife? Right, and just starts having conversations. Actually starts creating relationships, building relationships. He, as, he, as he finished walking through the floor, he'd go in the break room and he'd pour coffee for whoever came in and he would just sit there and have a conversation. That's how he started his day every day without fail. So I asked him one time, I said, look, we got a lot of work to do. We're, we're down to the $2 million. How much time are you gonna spend in the break room? What are we getting out of that? And he said, he said, well, I don't understand the question. If we don't build relationships with our employees, if they don't know we really care, how can they care about our customers? I went, I get it, I got it, and I was hooked. So that's why we have a blue unicorn in the break room. What's a blue unicorn? A blue unicorn is a true social leader. And we call it a blue unicorn because we're not just looking for any unicorn, that's how rare these guys are. We're looking for a specific color of unicorn. All right, that's a blue unicorn. So what, is, what are the traits of a blue unicorn? Well, first of all, as I said, it's not about social media. Matter of fact, quite the opposite. When people first started social media, we were broadcasting to people. We were talking at people. We were self-promoting. We were talking about ourselves. We weren't helping, we weren't providing value. Now we know it's more about building relationships, a digital handshake, if you will, okay? Second thing, we already talked a little bit about this is active listening. Your company can build for almost no, no investment at all. Go by, uh, anybody have TweetDeck? Or have heard of TweetDeck? Write this down, it's free. TweetDeck.com, free download, by Twitter. You can get TweetDeck and you can, through hashtags, you can build several columns, all keywords. You can track your, people talking about your company, your products, your competition, everybody, it's free. Just pay an intern to sit there and watch for something to pop up. That's all you gotta do. And now we're social listening. Now you can go from there all the way to multi-million dollar social command centers. Google has an amazing command center, right? They, nothing gets by Google, nothing, ever, period, right? But they're actively listening. They're finding out what people really think, not what their employees think, not what their marketing team thinks, what their, what their customers think, what their employees think what their partners think, right? Nothing gets by them. All right, the next thing is they're relentless givers. Has anybody read Adam Grant's book called Give and Take? Okay, you gotta write that one down too. Excellent book, I saw a couple hands go up. Um, Adam, Adam puts people in the business world in three categories. Givers, the people that give spontaneously and for no ulterior motive, they just make people around them better. Then there's matchers. Matchers will give to people, share, they will share information, they'll share their knowledge, but only if there's something in it for them. Okay, then there's the takers. The takers are people who, do, who just broadcast, who just self-promote. All they care about is themselves, at least online. Okay, we took this a step further when we wrote our book. We called it the relentless giver because true social leaders are always giving. They're always sharing the newest blog post by Seth Godin. They're always sharing industry-related information. They're sharing it out to everybody because they want everybody to have the same knowledge they do. They don't hold anything back. They don't feel the need to be the expert. They want everybody around them to be their own expert in their own niche. And that's the relentless giver. They also know that relationships and ROI matter. I was in a great uh, breakout session today where where we talked about people who were really good at relationships but they never got anything done. Called them slackers. 
okay? Um, it's really great to be good at building relationships. You probably all work with one. You might even be married to one. But if you never get anything done, it doesn't matter, does it? Right? So we can't just get on social media and start pinging away and building relationships that don't have any value, that aren't mutually beneficial. We still have the metrics that we're tracked by as leaders. We still have the bottom line to hit, right? So relationships and ROI matter. All right, a big, a big thing we heard, we've heard about today is networking. And what we call networking, our version of networking is called OPEN. It's an acronym for Ordinary Person, Extraordinary Network. And it gets right back to that sharing thing and, and surrounding ourselves with fellow relentless givers. It basically means I don't have to be the expert, but I have to know the experts. And I don't care if they work for my company, I don't care if they're a consultant, I don't care if they're just somebody I met in casual networking, they might even work for the competition. But I have a problem I need to fix right now and I need that expertise. And I, because, I've been value, because I've been sharing value, because I've been a relentless giver, I get to now ask a favor. I finally get to ask. And I'm gonna call those people in. All right, that's where we become Chief Facilitation Officer. There's so many acronyms now. Chief Fun Officer, Chief Leadership Officer, Chief This, Chief That Officer. The, the biggest compliment we can get as social leaders is Chief Facilitation Officer. And it's really simple. You get the right people, in the right room at the right time. That's your job. And it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or the newest intern. If you have this talent, you're a social leader. You're a blue unicorn. All right, so really quickly, we're gonna do a little exercise here just to show you, because the way we used to lead kind of industrial age, it was more autocratic, more demonstrative, a little louder, more decisive, right? We, didn't, we, we were expected to be the experts, right? Everybody knows that style of leader, yes? Okay, very loud, kind of obnoxious, but effective sometimes, because that's the way we were all trained, right? Now we're talking about social leadership. It's a completely different way of leading our organizations or our teams, right? So that's, so, that's social age, all right? So we're gonna, ask two, we're gonna ask two questions of you guys. One, this one, design me a vase. This is an industrial age question. Here's the scenario. You work for a vase company. You work for a, a company that does nothing besides producing ceramic and other style vases. Business is bad. It's terrible. All right? We need a new product. We need, we need a shot in the arm. All right? So everybody, please, take 30 seconds or so, write, use a pencil and paper, design me a brand new vase that will just knock the socks off the market. All right? I know you're thinking, I can't draw. It doesn't matter. Just start drawing. Design me a vase. Marketable, scalable, repeatable vase. I know 30 seconds isn't much time, but I only have 30 minutes. You only get 30 seconds of it for this one. And the first person that has something they think really cool, raise their hand. I know nobody told you you'd have to think today, huh? If the person next to you is not drawing, give them the elbow. They're not collaborating right now. You, you're not collaborating right now. Gave you gave him the elbow? Good. <laughs> All right, who's got something really cool? Anybody? Exactly. Oh, you do? You have something really cool? Tell us about it really quick. Minion you what? A, a minion on it. <laughs> So it's repeatable and scalable for DreamWorks. <laughs> or DreamWorks, I think, yeah, all right. So here's the, so take your idea, wrinkle it up. Tear it out of the notebook, just tear it out. Wrinkle it up, throw it away, because it sucks. <laughs> and it sucks not because your, your minion base isn't really cool, because it sounds like it is, but because I'm, I asked an industrial age question. All right, here's what a social leader would ask. Design me a better way to enjoy flowers in the home. More importantly, work with your teammates. Grab like the four or five people closest to you that you can make eye contact with and talk this out. Take one minute and talk this out. Design me a better way to enjoy flowers in the home. And if it doesn't get loud in here, we're not doing it right. That's a hint.
The elbow rule still applies. If you have somebody not cooperating, give them the elbow. If anybody picked up the picture they drew of the base, we're throwing you out. Because you're not getting it. Is that what you just did? I did. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you got to go. Security. All right. Just a few more seconds. All right. Who now this time who has something really cool they want to share? Anybody? You going to make me pick somebody? Yes. And then you need to buy more vases. That's right. That is friggin' brilliant. <laughs> I love that. Right? Now, compare that to what you drew. Well, that's what I started out. Oh, you <laughs> smart, smart butt. <laughs> so, you, so you're a social leader because you just made everybody else around you better. Uh, right? Okay. okay. You're a blue unicorn. All right, did everybody feel the difference? Two completely different questions. One of the best parts about being a social leader is we don't have to have all the answers. It's liberating. It frees us up hours a day. We don't have to come up with the solutions. We have to get the right people in the right room at the right time. That's it. And here's the next best thing. All you have to do is state the challenge, give the people the right tools, the right technologies, and then get the hell out of the way. Let them talk. Let them think. Bring them donuts, whatever, you know, coffee, sugar, whatever it takes, right? Happy hour. Who cares? Get the right people in the right room at the right time. Get out of the way. Because people within your company, they know the solutions. They know the answers. They've just never been asked. They've never, be, they've never been challenged to contribute. That's what social leadership does. How did it feel, the difference, the, the, two, the two questions? How did it feel? Who wants to share real quick how it felt? Now I'm going to pick on somebody. What was the difference for you? Yep, you. I don't know. I think I think a little more free the way you posed it the second time. You take it in a bunch of different directions, whereas initially it was very straightforward. Perfect. That's that's it exactly. And by the way, um, the tools and techniques that I gave you in the first question were completely limiting. What if I can't draw? What if I'm not visual? Right? Or what if I prefer to use a computer instead of a pencil and paper? Right? It's completely limiting. So you, you absolutely nailed it. That's it exactly. So that's one of the challenges after, after today's work is go home and think about, am I asking the right questions? Am I asking a social age question or am I asking an industrial age question? Or worse yet, am I barking out industrial age orders? Right? That's the difference. Whoops, one too far. How do I back up? Red button, oh, I don't have a red button. All right, so what are the benefits of social leadership? When we were writing our book, we talked to about 600 leaders, from CEOs to, to intern leads. And we pulled them on what, what they actually saw when they actually started incorporating social leadership. Now, Carol talked about some of this earlier today. First and foremost, we were building brand champions, advocates, and ambassadors. People just weren't happy or satisfied with the products. They're out on Twitter and LinkedIn, and Facebook, and Instagram, and Pinterest, talking about, man, I love Chick-fil-A. I just had Chick-fil-A for lunch today. They finally moved into Washington. I love Chick-fil-A, right? You can't pay for that kind of advertising, right? Second thing is we, be, we begin to create this innovation cycle, like you guys did very momentarily with the base, with the base solution, right? You, you start to talk. You start to build this collaborative environment that's not subject to Twatty syndrome. Twatty syndrome, the way we've always done it. There's a session at four o'clock today. I can't, I can't wait until, I can't remember the speaker. If you're in your room, stand up. I'm giving you an advertising moment. Nope, not here, too bad. All right, so four o'clock today, there's this very subject gonna be talked about for 45 whole minutes. 
All right, we start to build that collaborative culture and climate. People start to expect to contribute. Right? We're paying people good money to work for us. Do we really just want a bunch of automatrons doing exactly what they're told, or do we want to engage their creativity? That's what social leadership does. Finally, we start to share our learning experiences. If we learned something today, if we read a new blog post, if we read a new article, if we found out some new industry information, we start sharing it with our entire team. Everybody becomes smarter, stronger, better. And finally, from the customer point of view, we start to develop customers for life. People will leave you if you're only competing on price or delivery. People will not leave you if you have a great relationship. In our business, we have people, especially on the U-turn side, we have massive job boards that are going, burning through $6 million a month competing with us burning $1,000 a month. People will call us and say, you know, internships.com is offering me a great deal. What, what do I do, right? Our customers come to us and tell us when the competitors go to them, right? You can't ask for anything more than that, right? That's the kind of customers for life you want to build. And here's the real key. Who goes to the new Mexican, Mexican restaurant in town anymore without going to Yelp first? Anybody? Anybody not a fan of Yelp? You're not a fan of Yelp? You don't, you don't ever use, I never use, Yelp sucks. Um, oh, no, my 76 year old grandma uses Yelp, are you kidding me? All right, um, this is the way the world works now. We don't care what we say about us anymore, right? If we have a new employee, where's the first place we go to check them out? LinkedIn, right? If, we, if they say they're a social media guru, we go to Twitter and Facebook and everywhere else, right? And we do all that before we even talk to them. Employers, HR, they get that resume, what's the first thing they do? They call them up and, and say hi? No, they go online and they check them out. Right? Yelp, Indeed.com, Glassdoor.com. By the way, the, the job seekers are doing that to us too. They're finding out exactly what kind of an employer we are before they even send their application. Right? Everybody here at Glassdoor.com? Pretty amazing site, right? Not always objective, by the way. Right? Not always objective, but you get a good, pretty good insight. Here's what's really important. If you have a bad review on Yelp, or a bad review on Glassdoor, and you as a community don't take the time to answer it, or somebody from your community doesn't take the time to answer it, what's the, what does that infer? That's true, right? It's true. If you don't answer in a thought-provoking, sincere way, completely transparent, even if you have to say, you know what, I'm sorry that plate of enchiladas was bad last night. We, we, weren't, up, we, we weren't at our best last night. Please come back in and give us another try. Boom, crisis over. But if you don't answer, or if you become a troll and you get defensive and you go online now and say something nasty, now you're done. Right? Everybody remember the Amy's Bakery story? Little tiny bakery, insignificant in the world of things, but somebody trashed her blueberry scones. She got on Facebook and went on an all caps tirade for like 1,200 words saying what an what a F-bomb idiot you are, F-bomb, 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 idiot, F-bomb. All right, 1.1 million views later, Amy's Bakery was out of work, right? Terrible, terrible situation, all right? So here's the moral of the story. What we say about us, now that we live in what's called the testimonial economy, what we say about us, that's selling, that's marketing. What others say about us, that's our culture, that's our brand, that's what we stand for. Right? So if we're not actively listening, if we're not on social media, if we're not communicating, if we're not building community, if we're not building customers for life, we're now behind all of our competition. That's what's changing, and that's how fast it's changing. This has all happened in the last five years, six maybe. That's how fast this is changing. All right now, who really cares about this? These guys. Who joined me in the collaboration breakout session today? All right, pretty good, right? They talked a lot about trust and how important it is to build trust. These millennials behind me, they care a lot about trust. They care a lot about being authentic. They care a lot about you being vulnerable. They care a lot about you admitting when you're wrong and fixing it, right? Even more important, they're the first generation to ever give themselves permission to enjoy their work. They expect more from us from us as employers and leaders and bosses and managers. Now, I don't know why the hell we didn't think of that. 
Right? I don't know about you guys. I was taught from my Irish lumberjack dad that you just go to work. That's what you do for a living. You're not supposed to enjoy it. What the hell's wrong with you? He still does not get what I do for a living. Doesn't have a clue. You do, you bl blog? You wrote, you wrote a book? Social what? He still doesn't get it, right? These guys get it. And they expect it. So if we're not changing, if we're not actively listening, if we're not out there in the marketplace building a community of customers for life and champions and brand, brand ambassadors, we're not competing well right now. Right? And guys, you can't wait for HR to do this. HR sucks. Hey, sorry if anybody's in HR. That's my bad. <laughs> HR sucks. They just, they don't get it. Who the hell ever put HR in charge of leadership and culture? Makes no sense, right? This is our job. Unless you guys just don't ever want to attract and employ anybody under 35. Anybody not interested? No, right? We got to start the change. We got to start it right away. So how do we do this? How do we inspire? Let's just say you get all fired up. Um, we have a phrase at, at Switch and Shift and U-Turn. It's called actionable inspiration. We don't want to get up here Tony Robbins style and get, you feel so good and then have you walk out to the other side and go, wow, I feel good. I don't know why. And I don't know what to do next. Right? And, and I love a lot of the conversations that happen today because there's, all, there's a lot of actionable stuff you're bringing home. Well, here's some actionable stuff. How do you go home and get others to embrace social leadership? First of all, you have to explain this is a new era. There are new expectations and the millennials are coming. And a new estimate said that by 2020, millennials will make up 75% of the workforce and 35% of leadership. They're coming. They're here. They're already the majority workforce, the majority generation in the workforce right now. All right now they're going to become the super majority. They care. All right, you have to champion the good. When something good happens, when one of your employees does something amazing, when one of your customers has a really good story to tell, let them tell it. Let them amplify it. Get on social media and go crazy with this. All right, has anybody heard the Panera Bread story? So Panera Bread, I got to make this real quick because it says two minutes and 24 seconds, so I'm freaking out. So Panera, Panera Bread, they have a, a grandma is dying. Okay, she's, and, and she's got two days left. Her grandson comes over and says, Grandma, what, what can I do? How, how can I make these next two days better? And they're both in tears. She goes, you know, I just want to keep it simple. I love the clam chowder at Panera Bread. Can you go get me some? And he went, okay, Grandma. She's losing it, but okay, clam chowder it is. So he goes to Panera Bread. It's a Thursday. Everybody knows Panera Bread doesn't make clam chowder on a Thursday, right? It's a Friday thing, <laughs> right? So he goes to the manager and says, look here, I just promised my dying grandma I was going to bring you clam chowder. You don't have any clam chowder. What do I do? And she goes, give me an hour. So she goes and makes him a big bowl of clam chowder. He takes it home. Grandma loves the clam chowder. He goes on Facebook that night and says, saw my grandma for the last time, brought her some, from, some clam chowder from Panera Bread. She loved it. It was amazing. Panera Bread was great. He doesn't even tag Panera Bread. It's so innocent. He's just like journaling, talking about his last visit with his grandma. The mom sees this and she, re, she, re, she shares it. And this time she tags Panera Bread. 878,000 comments later, Panera Bread stock took off. They became a company based on one incident in one store that cared about people. Their stock went up that quarter 28%. Their in-store sales that quarter, same, same store sales, 27%. All based on amplification of one post on, on Facebook, one post. Right? That's what this does for us. So you got to champion that stuff. And when somebody does say something bad, like we talked about before, you got to make it go away. The ugly, well, sometimes it does get ugly. Social media is ugly. And the social lynch mob is just waiting for you to mess up. They're waiting for your company to mess up. They're waiting for your, one of your leaders to mess up. Google the CEO kicking the dog in the elevator story. It's just tragic, but it really happened. Right? Boom, done. CEO's done. Company's done. One one transgression in an elevator, caught on film. And finally, guys, we have to embrace the challenge. We have to be willing to be a blue unicorn. We have to be the ones to say, you know what, I'm going to start doing things differently. And I'm not asking you to add two more hours onto your workday, because what you're going to find as you start to embrace this is you're freeing yourself up so much more in other areas. You, you start to realize, you know what, getting my email inbox to zero doesn't really matter because I have relationships to build. I have partnerships to build. 
I have people to listen to, right? And then the emails start going away. It happens. Okay, I used to get 300 emails a day, now I'm down to about 40. Because I'm actually out there communicating, right? Okay, well, here's the most important thing is you have to hire for the culture you want three years, three years from now. Not everybody's gonna, gonna embrace this right away. Not everybody's gonna become a social leader or a blue unicorn. Not everybody's gonna rise to this new challenge. So as you're hiring, start hiring blue unicorns. Start hiring the people that you know three years from now are gonna represent your brand the way you want them to, you would, the way you wanna be seen, right? Hugely important. Second part of this, attrition is your best friend in these situations. It doesn't matter if the hiring mistake was made three weeks ago or three years ago or 15 years ago. If somebody doesn't embrace this new way of doing business, this new way of leading, this new way of treating our customers, they are not an ally. And it's give them permission. Let them go somewhere where they'll be happy. Let them go enjoy their work somewhere else because they're not going to do it here. It's fine. Just everybody agree it's fine. Go be happy. Sapos does this great. Everybody, um, recently, Zappos uh, went to a holacracy. Not everybody embraced the holacracy. So what did, what did Tony Shea do? He paid everybody to leave. They didn't want it. Best, smartest layoff in corporate history. 14% of the workforce left. Didn't have to lay anybody off. No unemployment benefits. Gave him a check. Leave. Go. I don't want you here. You're not happy. Right? It was brilliant. He embraced that attrition is an ally. Okay, so what does this really mean? It sounds good, it kind of sounds fluffy, but here's some examples of companies that have embraced social leadership and the impact it's had. Taco Bell through Snapchat, not Twitter, not Facebook, not LinkedIn, Snapchat, primarily Snapchat, in some vine raised their market share among millennials 22.2% in six months, all through Snapchat campaigns. KLM, just reported a little while ago that they raised $25 million in addition in sales through social listening on Twitter. All they did was listen to, com to people complaining about their competition and then saying, hey, I see you're in JFK and you're not happy with United right now. We'll honor that ticket. $25 million in additional sales from Twitter. All right, there's several more examples. One of them from, from the supply chain industry, logistics industry, Conway in 2010, five years ago, started tweeting that they had LTLs. And if you're driving along the road right now and you need more work, you want more cargo, tweet us back. We'll find you. Five years ago, they started doing that. Their revenue went through the roof. So this isn't just talk. It isn't just fun and games. This is real world examples of companies doing amazing work as social leaders in the social space, in the social age. All right, so how do we, how do we really get through this ourselves? All right, how do, how do we make a difference? First, you have, to have the, you have to take on the responsibility. We already said that. You have, to be, you, you have to choose to be part of this new era and you have to lead by example. You have to, right? If you talk about trust, if you talk about vulnerability, if you talk about accountability and then you're not, you're not trustworthy, you're not accountable, you're not vulnerable, then it doesn't work. We have to obliterate our comfort zones. This is one of our big, our big talks with college students and leaders and, and, and especially the military veterans. What you know doesn't matter. It's what you're about to learn that matters, right? Leave your comfort zones. And then finally, you have to strive to be a blue unicorn because nobody's gonna do it until you do. Especially when you get up into that VP, CXO category, if you delegate social leadership, it's going to fail. Now there are instances where it does middle out and bottom up. We can create pockets of excellence. It's one of the best parts about social leadership. But if you want it to really impact your culture, your clients, your business, you have to own it. Okay, and just like Bud, at the beginning of the story, it only takes one person. It only takes a few minutes a day. Go strike up a conversation. I heard today, where's John? John, I heard this about you today, that you actually walk the floor and have conversations. How dare you? As CEO, that's not your job. But that's what he does, and his employees love it. They told me, today, all right? You're a blue unicorn already. Congratulations, it only takes one of you, and you can change, make a difference. All right, I think we still have time for questions. Do we, Ed? Yes? Yes. Okay, all right, any questions? Thoughts? Even if you're just, Mark, you're full of crap. This is not gonna work at my company. Hello. 
Hello. Oh, you have a microphone. I can hear you. Thank you. you. Um, so you gave a couple of great examples of uh, people behaving badly to the social lynch mob, but um, give us a little, um, you know, what would be your recommendations when something bad happens? How do you, how should oh, you handle it? Oh, that's a great question. You got to own it. Um, again, this is, Here's, here's, what, here's what happens, right? We all do something we're not proud of in our personal lives and our corporate lives, our professional lives. It's going to happen, right? But then we can't do the cover-up thing. We can't do the, the make excuses thing. You, have to, you just have to come out and say, like, right away. And train your social media team, your marketing team, your interns, anybody that has access to the Twitter handle. The first thing they say is, wow, we really messed that up. We got this. We're going we're gonna to make this right. Just give us a few minutes. We're going to make this right. That's it, that's all you have to do. And then shut up. That's all you have to do. If you get in a big dialogue and a back and forth, it's a disaster. But if you just own it right away, Cindy, then you're, people love it when we're contrite. People love it when we're sincere, right? We can't, the one, uh, unfortunately in the early days of social media, we learned three things. We learned how to fake sincerity, schedule spontaneity, and manipulate motivation, right? This is 1974 stuff that does not work today. And if you make a mistake and you don't own up to it, you're, it's just gonna, it's just gonna fan the flames, and it, it, boy, it can go viral quick. All right, guys, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today.